I got to know George Paddington in the late 70s through my husband Tony, son of George. An interesting character. He was already retired, still painting and enjoying his friends. But if there's an empty canvas, let's put something <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, you know, going like this with the music and all of it. <laughs> it was it was it was a joy whether anybody likes the painting or not it doesn't matter a damn you had a <laughs> time. Uh, yeah. here uh, here uh, I'm painting it I'm the one that's enjoying it I'm not giving you damn about whether anybody else likes it or not in for in fact I, I don't care about whether other people like my work yeah. because it's uh, I'm the one that's getting the the fun out of it when he was a young man he had a few successful exhibitions of his paintings. But every time he was approached for publicity purposes, they asked him where he was born. For him that meant the press would poke around in his past and they would find out that he was one of the so-called home children. And do you know that you can become so involved in a painting something that's very obvious you should have been able to have seen. And all those paintings of downstairs of where I just put a daub of paint mm -hmm. here, but blues and yellows and purples and so on, and get them to sing. Yes. Or at least I try to. <laughs> and getting them, doing all these things is more is difficult. Everybody says, oh, you have a wonderful time. Yeah, sure you do, but there's a struggle too. I believe it. So it's not all just uh, uh, sitting down and playing. It's not a play thing. It's a it's a working thing. But you, yes. to enjoy your work is uh, is uh, the main thing. I think that it's the same with when I was doing work for the Star. It was work. I had to work hard at it to get something, and but it was fun too. Mm -hmm. You know, you mix the, you know, you, it was fun accomplishing something or what you thought you accomplished. Yeah. And, uh, and when you paint for somebody else, well, it's partly theirs, it's not yours. Yeah. And it's better, I think it's nice to make a lot of mistakes and, and uh, paint a lot of things that people look at and say, what is it? I, I think that so many, there's so many painters of pictures and there's so damn few artists that seems to be the, what it's all about. Well, I don't think he actually had one painting and then he worked at that painting. It wasn't that. It was like, it was, he did one here and he did one, and then he'd get another idea over here. I know one of his techniques was he would do oil painting and it takes a while for oil to dry, right? So then he'd go over and do another one, and then he'd go back, and what he'd do is he'd take chalk, like uh, pastel chalk, and he'd write and draw on over top of his oil painting just to get a bunch of different ideas, and then eventually he'd go back and then paint in oil over top of the chalk. He just was a very talented guy, so some of his paintings are incredible, as amazing as any of the group of seven who would be his contemporaries. I think his paintings, many, many of them, not all, because he did a lot that he just did them quickly and put them aside, but his good paintings that are just incredible. They're just amazingly good paintings. He was an easygoing man. He made you feel comfortable when you talked to him. He it really is self-taught. He was only once, one summer for two months, he had a summer school um, attended a summer school which was arranged by the Ontario College of Art. George loved to show his work and say, well, go downstairs. I have, I have hundreds of uh, paintings. So I went downstairs and uh, I look at all this painting and I say to myself, how can he do that? You know, there are so many. And this man is maybe already 60, 70 years old. And uh, he must have work all of his life, 
all of his life he's been uh, painting. Why do I go on painting, painting, painting when I get so get much, so many things here that I don't, I don't see them from one year to the next. I keep on painting more, more and more. What makes, it's a drive. It's something that you want to better what you've done. You want to say more in your paintings than what you've said. Uh, a person wants to make his language more beautiful. And he does that with uh, rewriting, rewriting and making it sound smoother and better. I think when you hear someone giving a lecture, and he's a good lecturer, it is beautiful the language he uses, and so it is with painting. Yeah, the, the easel always had a work in progress on it that, um, and it's for months it could be the same one, but he would work on these. But I would come up into the studio, and the way that the, the roof is designed, it has eaves in the walls. Uh, there are three separate uh, places in the upstairs studio that that have uh, room on the side of the roof um, where paintings were stored. Sketches of the city hall, of life drawings, of uh, opera, of places in Canada that how one man, how one man could possibly compose all these paintings. Um, they were everywhere. Um, and it, it just to me, it just showed the man's love of, of, of art, nature, and the beauty of Canada. Um, I, um, I'm not biased, as you can imagine, as his uh, daughter-in-law, but I love his paintings. And his paintings, to me, express a love of what he saw. And which is, uh, when you go later, uh, more into his life, you find out that that is quite astonishing because he did have a very difficult beginning in his life. And he, but he preserved his positive outlook of life. And uh, this uh, difficult beginning was just in one pocket of his life and did not affect the rest of his life. With George Padgington, he came from a family of three and his mother fell upon hard times. And for that reason, she had to choose one of her children to relinquish to the Bernardos. It, it's beyond the scope of our imagination what, what these mothers would have gone through having to pick which child would be relinquished. And one of the things that they often didn't tell the parents as well, too, is once they relinquished them to the Bernardos Care or any of the other sending organizations, that you forfeited your parental rights, which meant that you no longer had the legal right to decide what was going to happen to that child or not. I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't matter as long as a person is a, a good person. Well, it is good. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> but, um, I don't know, so many people like to stick with their own, don't they? What they call their own, their own background. Mm -hmm. And uh, all people are the same. They, they, no, there's no difference. Only that they, their customs probably, and their their backgrounds do mean something. That's that they're interested. Their backgrounds are interesting, but only for interest. Well, he wasn't in the community because he was not a, a joiner. He had his own friends, artist friends, all artist friends, and they had lots of parties and drawing classes and. That they went up north, that's what they did. And that's it. He was not a groupie. George Padgington entered the Canadian art scene at a very pivotal time. It was a time when the artists were trying to figure out how Canadian art could be placed into an international art scene. And it was the Group of Seven and the vision of Tom Thompson carried out by the Group of Seven that decided or that promoted that Canadian art could embrace the natural beauty of Canada and that could be explored as a defining style in which Canada could fit into a more broad vision of, of art around, really around the world and, and within Canada. George uh, also was very good friends with A.Y. Jackson 
and, um, and A.Y. Jackson was very influential on, on George. But George has his own style, and he was younger than the members of the group, and he, he took their work, but he did his own work. And, and, so, and that's where George's work fits into the history of Canadian art. He fills the gaps that were left with all of the attention that members of the group finally received years later. Because even when the group was studying, uh, even when the group was uh, painting, they were struggling. That pick painting, I, I worked hours and hours and hours. Well, and finally, yeah. Harry came one day and he, I said, I'm, I'm whacked. I can't, there's something wrong. I'm going to, I don't know whether, I've been debating whether I cut the thing in half. And there's a picture on that side and one on this side, see? Because this looks kind of nice, you're looking up the beach. But there's something about the painting. I tried everything with pastel. I made sketches of it. And it's that damn break wall, which comes right out here. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I kept thinking, oh, and that's beautiful. It's pushes you right out to, the, you know, it's a lie. Right, right. He said, um, uh, why not, just why not forget about the brick wall? And I had my brush in my hand and, the, and paint, and I said, that's what it is. Bang. Finished. In a, in a matter of two or three minutes, the whole thing was finished. You took the brick wall out? Took the brake wall out, did this, this, yeah. and then it was there was the picture. Yeah. But yet that brake wall was taking up was the main part of it. You know, right here. Yeah. It was gobbling up all the interest. Yeah. A brake wall. He learned naturally when he was painting, and and they were they are about um, two or three paintings, or I don't know how many, but where you can see the influence of the uh, group of seven where he had looked at that and he experimented with some styles which they had introduced and he experimented with that too. George was doing very well all throughout his, his career. He painted for, I would say, about seven decades, almost throughout the entire 20th century. He saw the country evolving and growing. He saw the advent of modernity um, in, in, in cities. He saw the rapid change or impact of, of industrial growth on the natural environment. And he was always there documenting all of those changes. His style remained, for the most part, impressionist or post-impressionist. There was some earlier works that tended to be a bit more realistic. They did show a tendency towards um, more historical paintings that favored the European style and even the Dutch style, but in a very kind of mild manner. Some of the his works are more contemplative, they're moody, they have some dark elements still within um, the feel of the picturesque. It wasn't until the very um, later part of his life uh, perhaps in the 60s and 70s, that we could see some of the works that he's done around his home in his garden and in his backyard that he completely let loose and moved towards abstraction. So there's a hint, obviously, at the environment, but you could see more of a focus on color rather than form. So in 1927, George joined the Toronto Daily Star, which is now the Toronto Star. He joined as an illustrator and he was there 37 years in the art department. It would be quite a shame to, to forget about him and, uh, and not remember the wonderful works of art that he's done. And especially because he was so in love, I believe, uh, with Canada. He deserves, he deserves this attention and he deserves to be recognized as a great Canadian artist. George's contribution to Canadian art is his legacy. In his later works, his approach to art moved away from the romanticism of the Group of Seven style into a more modern, abstract art. That, in my opinion, is where his real talent lies. <laughs>